Good morning. Happy New Year. Um, welcome to uh, fresh New Year's supply of uh, science lectures. Welcome to the, I think I see a lot of new faces today. And I think we can uh, credit it to Akash's magnetism. Uh, <laughs> this forum is very new. Uh, the reason we started this forum, I'll give you a little background. Some of us met at a couple of science lectures and then we started a group to notify each other of such lectures. And then after about a year, it turned out that we are just sharing videos and links and stuff rather than actual any science lectures. They are, either they are not happening or they are not you know, being notified. So we thought we might as well start a forum for science lectures and then we'll have a, a series of like monthly lectures and then we'll expand into activities. It'll be a forum where people get to know each other, we we'll have a WhatsApp page, a Facebook, we have a WhatsApp uh, group, Facebook page. People can communicate, learn from each other, and so on. So, and uh, since you know we are kind of doing it like you know open source kind of movement, we are just starting it. We are not you know have a business sponsor or any such thing. We decided that um, we would also have a nominal charge for it. The charge, the hundred rupees that those of you paid for it, you are paying mainly for the hall rental. Um, so uh, until we get some you know permanent sponsor or some other way to you know fund and finance it going forward, this is going to be the model for uh, weeks or months to come, months or years to come. And uh, I am glad that with that model we still have you know such enthusiasm that we have uh, several repeat attendants and uh, quite a few uh, new people coming in. One of the ideas we have actually had several science lectures in Madras before. Um, Going all the way back to, uh, uh, I, I recommend to you the um, video of last month's lecture when Professor Krishnaswamy Aladi gave a lecture and I gave an introduction which talked about the various different lecture forums starting right from the famous uh, uh, lectures where people like uh, international uh, scientists of great repute like Niels Bohr and uh, you know and uh, Murray German and a couple of others. Uh, world famous people came to Madras to give series of lectures and they had students like G.N. Ramachandran who is potentially considered a Nobel Prize winner of whom, about whom we had a lecture a few months back and Aladi Ramakrishnan and so some of these lectures actually led to the formation of Mad Science. But we had series of lectures after that also uh, both by national and international personalities. Very recently <coughs> some of you may know that the Institute of Mathematical Sciences started an annual series at the Music Academy. Uh, and but we have had this kind of thing going on, on and off, uh, uh, you know, at different fora. IIT is definitely you know regularly hosts the Shastra. In fact, very recently they had a Shastra where a Nobel Prize winner called Adai Yonath, a Nobel Prize winner for chemistry, and the chemistry of ribosomes spoke. So we have great lectures, but these tend to be very much higher end and for a very targeted you know uh, engineering community or medical community and so on. We wanted a forum where the general public can come in. Anybody, 7th, 8th standard student and above, who don't get an exposure to the history of the science. We get, we get, we get science presented or mathematics presented with a very ahistoric context. There is no history presented. The only legends you are most likely to hear are Newton's apple and uh, James Watt's tea kettle. That's literally all you hear. And maybe a pendulum or two somewhere thrown in between. But all of these guys have stories. His science is far more than what has been discovered the last 350 years, 400 years in Europe. It's got, you know, and even some of the science that we think we know, we barely know it. And they are always, almost always told by experts to other people who are experts in that field. So even somebody who is like a, you know, world renowned person on biology may not understand some simple concepts in mathematics or vice versa. And if that's the way, even within the sciences, and even there, there are fields of specialization. So, uh, famously, a uh, scientist called Lynn Margulis said all the biologists who are working on evolution almost invariably work only on plants and animals. And they completely ignore our microbes. Even though microbes have 3 billion years of evolution and plants and you know animals are only for the last 600 million years. So, that kind of thing. So, we want to you know capture you know that kind of audience. We want to take it to the so we had a few lectures, we have a YouTube page, we have a, you can go see those lectures there. Uh, 
we are not necessarily trying to get experts to speak though we want experts to speak about you know uh, high you know high physics or high you know very deep uh, kind of things and today is probably our most complicated lecture uh, but we want to uh, you know get the average person interested we want to pull in more people and we want mitosis that we want this group to multiply we want this uh, this kind of thing happening in other places we want to expand it to other cities and so on in fact I'm kind of surprised that there aren't already such things there they probably are and we don't know about it and we'll eventually stumble upon it so so much for the forum as such so a brief introduction to the speaker <coughs> Akash has been known to us we some of us are belong to another group called Human Heritage Trust and we are friends in you know several other ways before um, and Akash did his uh, engineering um, partly out of compulsion, almost entirely out of compulsion, I think. In uh, I'll, I'll ask partly. him to say partly. Okay. Okay. Partly, partly. So it, it's not it's not like he did a certain subject, but that was not his prime interest. He did graduate in engineering. Now he just recently joined a PhD program at Northern Illinois University. He did his engineering at well okay. BIT. And now he's moved on to physics. So not you know the standard. Uh, I'm going to work for Google, whatever engineering I do, kind of thing. But he's really interested in physics, so he's studying theoretical physics. He's uh, he's an avid musician or a music enthusiast. He occasionally sh shares videos of his singing or his flute playing on WhatsApp. Uh, we know that part. In fact, for a brief uh, couple of days, I was thinking he'll ask him to talk about the physics of music, and he'll do a, a demo also. But he wanted to talk about atomic physics. So first he said, you know, relativity for Rukmini party, and somehow it evolved into atomic physics for Alamelu party. Because he wanted to approach even, you know, he's, he's, actually it's a, from a phrase taken by his own message. He says, I want to explain this theory in a way that even a Madhisar Mami from Mailapur can understand. And we don't have Madhisar Mami's from Mailapur right now, but, you know, that was his approach. So I'll use his own words. His interests include history, science, the history of science. He's trekked the Himalayas. He plays chess. He skateboards, writes those sporadic short stories you would like to see. Uh, learned Latin, I don't know how far he's gone, probably at least some Latin and Greek from simply reading, reading science, I think. Explore cooking and eating, a plethora of cuisines, making remote control aircrafts, playing flute in the balcony and on WhatsApp, and sing to the world in the bathroom and on WhatsApp. So that's a brief introduction to him. I let, I'm not going to say anything about atomic physics, I'll let Akash take over. Thanks, Akash. Yes. yes. Uh, thanks, Gobu, for the wonderful introduction and uh, also to have invited me to this uh, Varahamira forum. In fact, uh, when, I came, uh, when I came from US and I called Gopu and I told him that I'm here, he asked if I could uh, give a talk and then I told, sure, I would be really interested in giving one. And then the next few days when I was hopping and trotting from one kacheri to the next and uh, whenever a boring alapana or a monochromatic raga or worse, the combination of both came up. I used to take my mobile and start jotting down points uh, about which I can possibly talk about. And after two days or so, the points grew monstrously large that when I sent the message to Gopu, he replied back, is it going to be a talk or is it going to be a course? So and then, and then I realized that, of course, this is too ambitious and I was just jotting down whatever was coming to my mind. Um, initially, what I had thought was I should talk about. So when, when you look at the 20th century physics, there are two things which are the pillars of the 20th century physics. I'm talking about fundamental physics. When you talk about physics, there are lots of physics. You have laser physics, molecular physics, atomic physics, nuclear physics, and you have condensed matter physics or solid state physics. In fact, names which you, wouldn't, you, would, you would have not even heard of. But what I'm talking about is uh, the most fundamental physics. I mean, the laws which you can use to, to describe other laws. If you look at that, there are only two theories which stand out and are the ingredients. And one is special relativity and the other is quantum mechanics. So I thought that perhaps if I can, I can talk about both, but I know that I cannot do justice uh, both to the, neither to the topic nor to the audience if I talk about both. So I thought that let me talk about quantum physics because one, relativity is something which we hear about. Uh, ah, thank you. So relativity is something which we hear about uh, once in a while, but quantum mechanics is something which you don't hear at all. So, um, and also quantum mechanics is a bit uh, spooky, if I can use the word. And it's also very, very counterintuitive. 
and uh, so even even though as 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 gopu said the 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 title first was uh, relativity for rukmini party and then i thought quantum mechanics for kamala party but somehow atomic theory for uh, alamelu party uh, rang the most uh, um, pleasant ring to the ears but um, so uh, uh, by the way one or two people in facebook were like na alamelu alamelu party na onnu theriyada abindu a theriyadala onnu kedaiyadu but uh, it is just that uh, people um, Alamelu party is just a metaphor for people who might not even have heard or you know have a uh, care to learn about it that's it now there is no demeaning alamelu party so so before i talk about before i talk about the atomic theory um let us first look at how physics was like in the verge of the 20th century which was 1899 so what did we know in 1899 well we knew the newton's law of mechanics and we also knew about gravitation we knew how celestial objects in the sky uh, evolved earlier also we knew where the positions were and how the patterns were going on and so on and so forth but newton gave a theory which could predict how it, how even a new system might evolve so we were we were fairly confident about the laws of mechanics and gravitation and then light which is a daily day object if you can call it an object was established to be a wave then then electromagnetism which is a theory of electricity and magnetism was put in place in the 1800s by many people but it was put into a very short and a very elegant form by uh, a guy called maxwell uh, james clark maxwell it was a phenomenal achievement of 1800 uh, physics and then it's a mix of both we knew that light was to be a wave we knew light was to be a wave and then again uh, light was to be an electromagnetic wave which is again a big achievement and there were also uh, some work going on in uh, fluid mechanics uh, people like uh, bernoulli and so on and so forth were interested in uh, uh, laminar flows and so on and so forth that was going on and then the thermodynamic laws which is the uh, study of heat oh okay ah it still works yeah so the thermodynamics uh, th thermodynamic laws which were about the study of heat and transfer of energy between one system and another it was also somewhat put into place now i use the word somewhat but this is in fact going to be a key later on because there were many unresolved problems which was lurking in uh, the thermodynamic laws and then a sense of achievement was actually uh, the people were you know uh, fairly complacent though not completely complacent people thought that ha we have figured out everything in fact uh, uh, one jolly who was uh, a high school teacher to max planck when max planck was in fact uh, we'll we'll look about max planck he told max planck that in this field almost everything is already discovered and all that remains is to fill a few important unimportant holes this was in 1878 actually and then this is another famous talk by albert michelson albert michelson is uh, a famous physicist you might have heard of this experiment called uh, michelson morley experiment uh, he in fact michelson is known for his uh, accurate measurement of the speed of light and uh, many other things and in fact he was the first american to have no to have been awarded the nobel prize in any sciences let alone physics it was in 1907 in 1894 when he was giving a talk he told that most of the grand underlying principles have already been established an eminent physicist remarked that the future truths of physical science are to be looked for in the sixth decimal place so he thought that laws are all kandupidichaachu all need that needs to be done is do more and more accurate experiments and in seventh or eighth decimal place we can have to find new laws and the eminent physicist remarked so who is he talking about i think he is talking about uh, lord kelvin who was apparently sitting and listening to that talk i am sure kelvin kelvin must have smirked but nonetheless this was the uh, this was their uh, sense of uh, uh, complacency but of course people were not just sitting and uh, and uh, loitering about there were a few lurking problems what are, what were those lurking problems so the problem was that one the speed of light we knew that the speed of light is finite but the thing is relative to what so when i say that a car is going at 40 km per hour what i mean is that it is going 40 km per hour with respect to the road right so when 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 i say at a water wave is traveling in the sea what am i talking about water wave is traveling in the sea with respect to c now when i say light is traveling at 3 lakh km per second with relative to what this question was nagging the physicists for a very long time in fact 
the in fact albert uh, uh, michelson whom we, who 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 scored we just saw he and uh, another uh, friend uh, called uh, morley they both devised an experiment to check oh okay is 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 light going uh, is light speed relative to something which fills the whole of the universe in fact their experiment suggested that no so the speed of light paradox was actually solved by einstein in 1905 and that theory is we know we, we know that as special relativity he told that no matter what your speed is even if you are going at 2 lakh 999000 km per second when you see light you will see light going at 3 km per second if we, if we, if we, if you are going at car right so if you go at 40 km per second if another car is coming in the opposite direction at 40 km uh, 40 km per hour you will see his car relative to you is going very fast at 80 km per hour but the same was not the case of light which was very counterintuitive to them so this was a problem which was of course later solved and then the statistics of thermodynamics was again a lurking problem uh, people had uh, some issues like there is something called maxwell's demon uh, and other uh, issues because we have to understand that during this time people were not entirely sure about the existence of atoms so the statistics of uh, statistics of thermodynamics was actually uh, on a very uh, quibbly foundation and this guy the ultraviolet catastrophe is in fact a seed for the birth of quantum mechanics so what is that so ultraviolet is something which we uh, associate with light and in fact it is so so before that i'll just briefly uh, tell you what light is so what is light so light is actually an electromagnetic wave made of oscillating electric and magnetic fields these are very big words don't worry if you don't know anything about it just assume that there is something called as electric field and something called as magnetic field now here is the thing we found that if you change the electric field a new magnetic field gets created we don't know why but experimentally we found that if we change the electric field a new magnetic field is created now if you ask is the opposite true if i change a magnetic field will a new electric field get created yes that is also the case in fact uh, you 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 know this as the faraday's law and ampere's law they were the guys who found both of these guys both of these uh, uh, truths so the next is how does light an electromagnetic wave manage to exist well the answer is as you see the blue is electric and the red is a magnetic so if you change the electric field a magnetic field gets created if you change a magnetic field a new electric field gets created so as you change red blue gets created as you change blue red gets created so in fact these are these choreograph and dance together in such a way that both create each other as they propagate along that is how light manages to exist in fact the very fact that i am seeing you and you are seeing me this is happening right now in this room if not for the self sustain self sustaining uh, mechanism light would not go so i why i am telling you this is that people knew that uh, in fact uh, after 1800s people knew that light is a wave i want to hit that point hard right now so light wave actually is not too different from water waves so water wave is something which you have seen if you have been to beach being in chennai you would know right so when two waves dash against against each other what happens so if if a wave that is coming down dashes against a wave which is going up both cancel if wave that is coming up adds to the wave which is already going up they both add up so in fact in if you go to marina beach you will in fact it is very rare to see both waves both waves adding up so i found a very fascinating video where both waves add up if i can shortly play this to you you see here a wave is going back and goes up this is not tsunami or anything it is just that a wave is coming and another wave is coming here and both add up at the same time so this is something called so both waves are interfering so this is called constructive interference a destructive interference is when they cancel that usually happens if you just go to marina you can always see uh, destructive interference almost always happening so oh so this is when you have two waves but this is a much more prettier picture to visualize so this is a point from which waves are originating this is another point 
from which waves are originating now this this is imagine this to be a light wave so the darker regions are where the two waves have cancelled and we have just darkness and the brighter spots are where the two waves have added up so now we have something called as uh, constructive interference so what what happens if i put a screen here so if, if you if you if you put a screen here you will get a very pretty picture of which I, i'm going to show you a little later so before that when i talk about wave so what is a wave wave is if I, if i ask you where the wave is it's a very stupid question right so wave is i mean if this wave is coming here if I, if it is you no know, when you see this laser dot and and if i ask you where the laser dot is you can tell ha ah, the laser dot is there at this time but if i ask you where is this wave it's a bit of a stupid question because the wave is you know it's almost the whole of this curve right but uh, so when i put a screen here you would see a very nice uh, pattern coming up so in the, uh, when you, when you talk of waves how would you specify the character of a wave so there is something called as a wavelength and something called as a frequency you don't need to know math to know what wavelength or frequency is if na kocham kocham chana kooda maarundhena it is high frequency and if it's paravala irundhathu romba kooda ma illa appadina it's low frequency this is in fact light when we saw that uh, dancing uh, uh, blue and uh, light em uh, waves uh, dancing we if 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 that width of that wave was very shortly packed then we say that the frequency of that light is very high so if the frequency is high that is when you get blue color if the frequency is very low romba padand irundhathu appadina you will see red color so then what is this ultraviolet catastrophe so in 1900 sir james jeans and lord rayleigh they put a law called uh, the rayleigh jeans law so what did it say so so the rayleigh jeans law said it, it said about the power of that radiation so it it to it above um um a certain uh, to, to 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 a certain window of frequency their law perfectly obeyed with the experiment so the the the, the, the law is called rayleigh jeans law and the law worked very well above the frequency of the uh, in fact the law worked very well below this is a typo very well below the frequency of uv light so the experiments drastically different ah, ah here here i put it very right <laughs> here i put it wrong so experiments drastically differed from his predictions below the uv wavelength so when you see this is the law in 1900 so in fact when i when i go back to that wave so what is the wavelength wavelength is nothing but distance between one uh, one uh, hill top to other hill top that is the wavelength if the distance is uh, zero what does it mean it means it means that there is no wave at all right so if the wavelength is zero it means there is no wave if there is no wave there is no radiation power only if there is wave we can talk of radiation power right but rayleigh jeans law if you go to wavelength zero it said the power goes to infinity it just shoots up which was ridiculous because this is the experimental curve which we found which experimentally of course it makes sense because when the wavelength is zero there is no radiation and uh, uh, the radiation power is also zero that's why be beyond this region this this curve does not agree so this was called the ultraviolet catastrophe so what what was the way out of this ultraviolet catastrophe so here enters our first persona who is Max Carl Ernst Ludwig Planck. In fact, I wrote the whole name because you can't get more German than this. So he was born in 1858 in Holstein, in Germany, and in fact, he was very, uh, uh, very much interested in music. He was an ardent musician, and he played uh, the cello, the organ pipe, and the piano. In fact, when he was in his high school, he was confused whether to take music or physics, and he went to his high school teacher, Von Jolly, whose quote we just saw. And Von Jolly told that, "Please don't take physics, uh, because al already everything has been discovered." But then Planck fortunately told him that it's okay. I don't want to discover any new laws, but I want to learn what the laws are, natural laws are. Uh, that's why he chose physics, and then, uh, of course, went on to even 
find a new field or rather it's it's uh, I, I don't want him to call the father of quantum mechanics because uh, um, there are just too many people who have contributed uh, enough if I call uh, Einstein the father of general relativity that would be absolutely apt because he, he almost single-handedly muscled through uh, the, the general relativity even though he consisted uh, he consulted a lot of mathematicians in uh, of his day but quantum theory is too far a big and complicated subject that I don't want, want to call anyone father of quantum mechanics. There, are fa there were fatherly figures of qu in quantum mechanics, but no father of quantum mechanics. And then uh, he was invited uh, uh, to Vienna in 1907 to take a Boltzmann position, but he politely declined the offer because he wanted to stay in Berlin. In fact, he was... Uh, he was in fact a true, true German, so to speak. He stayed in Germany through the First World War and uh, he in fact also stayed in Germany it, through the Second World War, he never sympathized with the Nazis. In fact, he was against Nazis, and he stayed. Uh, the, he was he was not a reactionary or revolutionary against uh, pl pl plotting against the Nazis, but he stayed in the Germany just to save as many Jews as he can. And in his own words, he was like, "I want to persevere through this war." So, in fact, uh, his son, Irwin Planck, he uh, he was actually involved in uh, reactionary activities and he was a rebel and then in 1945 he was uh, tried and executed by uh, the Nazi party's Gestapo for plotting against the Hitler's murder the famous July 20 plot about which uh, there was even a movie by Tom Cruise called Valkyrie if, if you have time do watch the movie it's a really good movie so Max Planck was uh, had a very sand heading he was his fourth son but nonetheless he was his closest and in 1940 in 1945 he wrote a letter that he has no more desire to live and he passed away in 1947 but nonetheless uh, he was invited to in Vienna to take a Boltzmann position Boltzmann in fact uh, it's another sad tale because uh, Boltzmann was uh, Boltzmann's ideas were not really taken kindly because physicists thought that he was wrong. In fact, one of his most famous contributions, which is called the entropy, uh, people didn't believe him. And they say the reason is because he didn't get along well with a, another physicist called uh, Ernst Mach. Mach is the unit which we use for the sound. When you go in flight, you can see that your flight is travels at 0.79 Mach. So he, he didn't get along and then he, was, he went into depression. And in 1906, he uh, he committed suicide because his ideas were not taken seriously in fact his most famous contribution was entropy and uh, this is the only equation that I'm going, I'm going to utter in this talk and that equation is uh, entropy s equals k which is Boltzmann constant which we now call Boltzmann constant k times log of omega omega is something called microstate we don't need to worry about why I'm telling this is because in his uh, gravestone it, you have this equation engraved so that at least after his passing, people uh, uh, look back and realize. So uh, anyway, so Max Planck chose to uh, stay. So what did uh, Max Planck do to get out of this ultraviolet catastrophe? So he proposed a very radical thing. And that radical thing is that he proposed that the energy of light is not continuous. So in, what do you mean by it is not continuous? So he told that the light's total energy can only be a multiple of some elementary unit and this elementary unit depended only on the frequency of the light not its amplitude when you, when you, when you talk of energy if you if you imagine a simple pendulum so if you you you, you would think classically also it is true that a pendulum that is swinging very far has more energy than a pendulum which is swinging very sm with small amplitude but with higher frequency but that is not the case with light the energy of the light is purely dependent on its frequency and also the suggestion that it is made only of a multi of a of a multiple of an elementary unit that was very startling in fact when planck made such an assumption he didn't like it at all he told that i'm 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 doing this because there is no other way by which i can fit the experiment it is he called it's just a pure mathematical trick which he did to fit the experimental curve yeah, he was very reluctant. In fact, this curve fitting mechanism, this assumption, in fact, would radically change the way in which we view the universe itself. And we will see why. And next comes uh, Einstein. So 1905 was a very magical year for Einstein, Einstein because he published those four celebrated uh, papers, which is the Annus Mirabilis papers. And in July, he published uh, on Brownian motion. So this paper on Brownian motion actually uh, sealed 
the debate on the existence of atoms. Even even in 1905, people were slightly doubting. Even after the works of uh, works from uh, 1800s and uh, 1700s. Uh, people were still doubting, but this uh, he gave a very solid reasoning for the existence of atoms, which is Brownian motion is nothing but you take a water bottle and you put a pollen inside that. You would see that the pollen is not it does not stay at one place, but it will keep on moving. Coil madamari Why is it so? Because uh, well, in Einstein told a, a perfect reason for why, and in fact, in his paper you uh, you can even he even gave a method to find the size of the atoms through this Brownian motion. The Brown, because uh, Robert Brown was a, a Scottish biologist who studied this pollen uh, in, in a water a long time ago in 1800s. And in September, he published his famous uh, special theory of relativity. And then immediately, of course, the special relativity's immediate consequences mass energy, where you have the world's famous equation called E equals mc squared. But way earlier than all these, in March, he published his paper on photoelectric effect. So what is this effect? So this photoelectric paper, in this paper, he made a further pro bold proposal extending Planck's that light, that not only that the energy of light is quantized, but light itself is quantized. He told that light is made of particles. In fact, the, the, the idea that light is particles is not something new. Einstein himself, uh, sorry, um, Newton himself had proposed uh, this corpuscular theory where he thought that light was made of uh, discrete uh, particles. But then after that uh, experiments showed, as I showed you, that light was a wave and then he, people had to abandon that idea. But then there was this experiment called photoelectric effect experiment which was done by Hertz in 1888 showed that if you sh if you shine light or if you if you uh, bombard heavy energy light onto metals you, you see electrons spitting out on the other end the only way that you could expect ex uh, uh, could, you could explain that Einstein showed is is when you consider light as particles so this is also again because this is very very counterintuitive and people didn't have a clue of why this must be so because until that point every experiment did that, that was done showed that light was a wave so this was historic but this was going to be historically our first taste of something called as wave particle duality so we will see as we go along that is this a wave is this a particle it's a question which is going to uh, worry physicists in the next few years to come so in fact people think that einstein was most people think that einstein was awarded the nobel prize for uh, uh, relativity but no he was he was awarded for this paper on photoelectric effect is in fact relativity actually was experimentally confirmed uh, in fact uh, in 1905 uh, when he published a special relativity paper, many people came really close to publishing the special relativity, special theory of relativity. They were just that uh, the people of repute were reluctant that uh, their name would be uh, spoiled in case if it's not true. In fact, uh, Fitzgerald, Poincaré, and a lot of Lawrence and other people had a clue of, in fact, the consequences of special relativity were already given by Lawrence, but somehow they were reluctant. But however, uh, general relativity was as i said entirely einstein's own uh, uh, baby and it was experimentally confirmed in 1919 by arthur eddington when he went and uh, 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 so i don't want to get into general relativity but he went to a solar eclipse and when the when the when the moon completely uh, hides the sun at that moment you will be able to see the star that is nearby so at that time you can see that the light coming from that star is bended by the gravity of the sun and that is a proof for a general relativity but even then people were not it was not so well established but however the photoelectric effect was well established and the nobel prize committee will give you nobel prize only if there is an experiment that backs your theory else they won't give for example you might have heard of this particle called higgs boson and the higgs boson was discovered and it was actually proposed in 1960s by six people i think peter higgs uh, proposed his paper in 1964 that is what 50 years in in, only in 2012 and at CERN we found the Higgs boson and in 2013 he got the Nobel Prize because no matter how great your idea is or how novel it is if it does not agree with the experiment no it is not true so he was awarded in uh, 1921 for his uh, photoelectric effect and then even after this Arthur Compton did an experiment where again he took heavy x-rays and he bombarded metals and he saw that electrons were coming out in fact, this is famously called the Compton scattering experiment. And this was this convinced almost all physicists at that point 
that light was indeed made of particles. But then, of course, light was also thought to be wave. So is it a wave or a particle? In, in fact, in, um, it, it, the, the particle of light didn't have a name. In 1926, a chemist called Gilbert Lewis coined the word photon for such particle. Gilbert Lewis, uh, he was a chemist and uh, he was in fact the guy who who discovered uh, the covalent bonds and also if you had um, if you had the fortune or misfortune depends on you of taking a bsc or msc chemistry you would have learned about lewis dot structures and he was also the guy who suggested that electrons come in pairs he uh, he was nominated for nobel prize for about uh, 41 times but he never got one and uh, he uh, unfortunately um, was found dead in his lab and uh, in front of him, it seems that he was working with hydrogen cyanide. And it is not yet sure whether it was uh, intentional or whether it was an accident, but nonetheless, he was a very uh, uh, great chemist of uh, the 20th century. So that is the story of light. Ne next question comes, what are we made of? Okay, we knew that by 1907, we knew that atoms existed, okay? And then even before that, we knew that electrons existed because J.J. Thomson in his famous cathode ray experiment, he, he, uh, he established that electrons do exist. And then we also, so we also, since we discovered that electrons uh, exist, we know that uh, electrons are negatively charged. And we also know that the daily day objects are not electrically charged. So there is positive charge hiding somewhere which compensates the electrons negative charge so so the question is if the act so we also know that act atoms exist so the the positive charge must somewhere be hiding inside the atom so the question is how does an atom look like what is the structure of an atom so it was widely under speculation at that point so and then in the university of manchester uh, two students in 1909 uh, two students called Geiger and Marsden. They, in fact, first Geiger started doing an experiment, in fact, a series of experiments, and then uh, Marsden joined him. What they did was they fired positively charged particles, alpha particles, but we don't need to worry what that is, positively charged particles into thin gold foils. So what happened was, and then they had a zinc sulfide screen or some screen behind this foil and all around this foil. This, this screen can detect the sent alpha particles. If that alpha particle hits that screen, you will get a blip. So the question was, if I, if I shoot the alpha particle into a thin gold foil, what happens to this alpha particle that went into the gold foil? So they found that the, the particle deflected into many large angles. In fact, when Rutherford, uh, okay, so by the way, both of these students are uh, students of Rutherford, Ernest Rutherford. And uh, when Rutherford asked Marsden to check, hey, check if any alpha particles have directly uh, been reflected, 180 degrees. And then Rutherford thought that no, they would not be, but when they took the zinc sulfide screen and saw, but there was 180 degree reflection. In fact, Rutherford was so surprised that he, he wrote in his memoir that it was as surprising as taking a 15 inch shell of cannon and smashing it against a tissue paper and the cannon reflecting off of it. So it was as unexpected as that. So Rutherford, in fact, in 1909, Marsden and Geiger, what they did was, hey, we did this experiment. This is what happens. We don't know the theory behind this, but this is what happens. And Rutherford broke his head for over two years and then correctly interpreted that the atoms were made of a heavy but small positively charged center. Up until that point, this point, there were many speculations as to uh, where the, uh, how the atom looked like. In fact, J.J. Thomson put his famous uh, plum pudding model where he, where he said that atoms are made of a jelly kind of a thing, where uh, the, the positive centers are like plums inside the cake. So, but that was proven to be wrong because if, if that was the case, the scattering would have been all around. But you and also you would not have gotten 180 degree uh, reflections as frequently as this was the, as uh, these guys got and he did their experiment. So and then now the existence of nucleus was firmly established. So now the question is now I know that the nucleus is there. Where are the electrons? So this question where are the electrons is a very simple one. But this was again to plague uh, this. In fact, it's not even it is this word where 
we will see that this this word where in and itself is a very problematic word to ask so before that we will have to go to another personality who is of course the great uh, niels bohr so niels bohr was born in copenhagen in 1885 in denmark he was a lifelong close friends with his uh, younger brother who was 18 months younger called harald and he constantly wrote to him and harald was in fact told to be a much more smarter guy than bohr who took to mathematics actually and both were ardent footballers uh, in fact uh, in fact harald uh, harald was in the uh, danish national football team that participated in the 1908 olympics and he got a silver medal in that both were ardent footballers and bohr got his uh, theory uh, his phd in the theory of metals in 1911 uh, in fact when he did his phd defense it was 90 minutes and apparently the shortest on record so in fact he uh, he was in later when he wrote his memoir he he wrote that he was feeling sad that there was no one in the country that could come and judge him to uh, for, uh, to say whether his work is right or not so such was his uh, such, was, such was an esoteric topic that he did and then he opted to go to cambridge in 1911 now i i tell this because uh in in people generally would prefer a german university if they want to do physics because germany was the hot spot to do physics back then so he opted to go to uh, cambridge and the reason why he chose cambridge was because he just simply thought that england is the center of physics because newton and maxwell were there there's no other reason that i could find so in fact he himself writes since maxwell and uh, Einst, uh, and uh, uh, newton are there as the center of physics i'm going there to study so he he and then jj thompson was uh, in england and at cambridge but then jj thompson by 1911 had lost interest he was uh, in fact by that time very infamous to have not uh, to not replying to students or to not attending talks and so on and so forth so he he tried to talk with thompson but somehow he gave his uh, translated uh, uh, thesis but then uh, he could not strike strike a chord with uh, jj thompson and also he did not know english much he was a danish there was some language barrier and then he he happened to chance upon uh, rutherford who was very energetic in fact people write that rutherford climbs three steps at a time uh, that he is such an energ energetic person and he was also a very uh, charismatic uh, 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 teacher who would, who all the students liked and then in fact rutherford being an experimentalist did not like theorists in fact he thought that theorists are those who just play with symbols in fact uh, rutherford was a very colorful personality and also a very a slightly strong one that uh, he once said that all science is physics and the rest are stamp collecting so <laughs> but ironically he was awarded the nobel prize not for physics but for chemistry so he himself having said the statement is a chemist um, or his work was was qualified to give a nobel prize in chemistry rather than physics so but rutherford took a liking to bohr because he played football and uh, and also that bohr was not that kind of a theorist who would just uh, not care about what experiments are so the rutherford and bohr and rutherford had we must remember that rutherford knew that nucleus existed and then in bohr proposed the his model of atoms based on rutherford's experiment and he thought that a navy nucleus at the center and the electrons are orbiting around this nucleus that's what he proposed but there is a problem if we know uh, the electromagnetism told us that if a charged particle moves in a circle they must radiate so if they radiate they must lose energy so if they lose energy the nucleus which is positive charged should attract this electron which is negatively charged and the electron should go and smash and go and uh, bury get buried inside the nucleus in fact this should happen in the millionth and billionth of a second but then of course not you and i exist if 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 that was the case nobody would have existed and everything would uh, no no atom would have ever been stable so this is a problem but then bohr find a way out of it saying that okay okay electrons can orbit around the nucleus but only for particular energies and are and other energies they will just fall inside nucleus so th that are not possible so he told that so this this stable orbits he called those stationary orbits this doesn't make sense at all actually 
why should that electron of only particular energy should go and should circle the nucleus and other uh, why are other energy other energies prohibited for the electrons to have so this was a very weird proposition and then he also introduced a number called uh, uh, a principal quantum number which is n so that is nothing but just to say the to denote the orbit of the electron so n n equals 1 would be the electron in the first orbit n equals 2 would be electron in the second orbit and so on so again the shortcomings was that the Bohr at the Bohr's model worked fantastically well, but only for hydrogen atom and a single electron system. No other uh, atoms could be explained using his theory. And then <coughs> it was also a mystery again why, elect why electrons should have only particular uh, energies. So now he proposed that electrons go in uh, in a circle, but taking uh, uh, taking. Uh, inspiration from Newton's uh, planetary systems he, uh, Newton in fact told that no matter what a particle or a planet or a meteor or whatever it is it can go only in a conic section so conic section is nothing but uh, if you cut a cone like this perfectly parallel to ground you get a circle but the slant you get an ellipse if you cut through the center you get a parabola and if you cut like this you get a hyperbola so he thought that okay maybe they are in uh, in an elliptic orbit so Arno Arnold Sommerfeld proposed that in 1916 that it may go into an elliptic orbit so in fact Ar um, Arnold Sommerfeld introduced the another quantum number called K whereby it denoted the shape of the ellipse so whether ellipse can be uh, only arkala or ellipse gunda arkala other denote under the he had uh, the quantum number called K so but even then this was not uh, sufficient in fact Arnold Sommerfeld in 1928 after all the drama was over he came to Madras to give a lecture on quantum theory in fact he came to Sri Lanka and then from Sri Lanka he went to Madras and then he came to Madras and gave a lecture in presidency college and then uh, he wrote uh, that uh, the hospitality of the people is very nice but the mosquitoes are not and then he went to Bangalore complained again about the mosquitoes and appreciated the people and then he went to Calcutta and in Calcutta Raman was there Sir C.V. Raman and then Sommerfeld told Raman about informally that uh, he would uh, nominate Raman for the Nobel Prize. In fact, uh, C Sir C. V. Raman, it's an interesting uh, trivia that he, uh, he he was in fact sure, not because Sommerfeld told, but he was sure that he was going to get a Nobel Prize, and he booked the ferry. Couple get ticket at the Ticket at the daily morning he used to go and check the newspaper if they have announced the Nobel Prize or uh, or not. In 1929, he was not awarded the Nobel Prize. The next year came. Again, he booked a ferry, confident that he will get a Nobel Prize, and he went and checked the newspaper daily, and this time he got the Nobel Prize. And in 1930, he, he got the Nobel Prize. So, so Arnold Sommerfeld has uh, arrived and uh, gave a lecture in, uh, given a lecture in Chennai. So, so this even after doing all of these things, people were not able to explain anything uh, that was coming experimentally. They could not make sense. So what what was needed? A major revamp was actually needed. So now I want to just uh, quickly recap about the waviness of light. So this is nothing but uh, wave, uh, uh, the the picture which we saw earlier. So this you can consider it as a source and uh, light waves are coming from here just like how you you throw a pebble in a water you would see water waves coming up you can imagine this as a point where the pebble has struck and the water waves are let's just like how water waves would go out this is light waves now if you have two such holes this is something which we saw earlier at some points you have dark fringes and some uh, it's a dark spot and some parts some spots you have bright spots now what what happens if i put a screen here in fact this is a laser and this is where the lights have added up and the dark spots are where the lights have cancelled so this is the constructive interference and this is the destructive interference in fact this was done by Th uh, by thomas young uh, in i think uh, 1700s thomas young is another colorful character since uh, there is also some overlap with the uh, heritage and history folks Thomas Young also had an uh, interest in uh, linguistics and he after uh, during the during the Napoleonic Wars when the Rosetta Stone was discovered 
uh, people were uh, trying to find or crack the hieroglyphics and uh, uh, in France uh, Champollion was trying to crack the hieroglyphics but here Young was trying to crack the hieroglyphics and later uh, uh, in fact Champollion did not even have when the when Napoleon lost his wars Rosetta Stone was uh, taken away from France and uh, Champollion had to work only with the prints or the or the uh, what to say um, yeah yes so he, he, he in fact yes in fact Champollion despite not having the Rosetta stone he won the race and he cracked the hieroglyphics first young also did but independently so he in fact there is also a fascination with a few physicists with language in fact Murray Gelman who Gopu mentioned uh, who has also came to has come to Chennai uh, to Ekam Pranivas if he had uh, attended the previous talk he has uh, he he's also a, a, almost a professional linguist his fluency in uh, in linguistics is uh, matched by even few in the profession of linguistics uh, linguists uh, linguists themselves but anyway this is light now let us do the same experiment with bullets okay now i have a bullet let us say it's ak47 or whatever and i have two holes and i randomly spread fire at this wall now what happens if I close hole number two and, op and I open just hole number one? You would see that, okay, this hole is closed and predominantly the bullets get sprayed only in this spot. This spot is this, nothing but this guy. This is A and this is B. Left is A, right is B. So if I close number two and I just start firing, you would get bullets here. If I close this hole and I open this, what would you get? Exactly. You would get this right now what happens when I open both the holes you would get this right now let us do the same experiments not with bullets but with electrons subatomic particles electrons so what happens so now instead of that AK-47 imagine that to be an electron gun which do exist if I if if if, if I open the first slit I get this so th these are nothing but electrons right this is almost the same as what happened with the bullets if I close the first hole and open the second hole I get this right now what happens when both the slits are open for the electrons you would expect like just like in bullets some some electrons here and some electrons there but no magically you get a wave like behavior these are nothing but just like how you saw for laser lights these are interference springes so this is absolutely stunning because you never expect electron which is a particle if you have a screen again as i said a zinc sulfide screen if you hit you can see that the electron is just a particle it is not a wave or anything of that sort but then this how how come electron can behave in this manner so in fact i this is nothing but uh, an, an actual single electron experiment done by Hitachi in 19, 1979. So I'm just quickly play this for you. So this is a single electron that is hitting the plane and we have two slits open. You have to imagine the two slits are open. The, the electrons are coming in and hits the screen and now the, the electrons are only emitted occasionally from the it's not like a constant a bullet stream occasionally an electron will come so at, at a given time only one electron is coming in so as you see now you don't see any behavior right it's like as though bullets have been randomly being spread so in the electrons are by particles we pass through random so by prism by prism is nothing but you can imagine that to be holes just like for the bullets but now as more and more and more and more electrons accumulate you can start to see slight fringes coming up imagine this is not all the electrons coming in this is coming one electron coming through the hole at a time either this hole or that hole and as time goes along can you see the fringes you see there is nothing here crowded here nothing here crowded and this is after a long time you see a dark and and a bright bands so now the thing is only one electron is coming in so if, if light 
if, if it was light we knew that a light from we know that a light is coming from this hole a light is coming from that hole and both dash against each other and you have dark spots or bright spots but only one electron is coming through the question is what does it mean so does it mean that the electron is going through both the holes at the same time if that is so how can it be the case so it is it is it is idea yeah, it is as though a single electron went through both the cells at the same time and they interfere and like light they are being uh, uh, interspersed on the screen so but then the electrons are different from light in the sense that it has mass but their behavior at subatomic scales happens to be the same yes sure yes sir how this experiment was done in that chamber yes was it a perfect vacuum was it a perfect vacuum vacuum yes 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 absolutely there is there is there is no it's a very good point there is no atom there is no air nothing empty space and electron coming in but did they have that kind of technology in those days Oh yes, yes, yes. Oh yes, even in 1979 we had very good uh, uh, experiments. In fact, mm -hmm. oh no, 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 1979. Hitachi was Hitachi founded in 1800s. This was known by Hitachi, right? It. I'm sorry if I told 18. It is 1979 in 1979. In fact, you, I doubt if you even had uh, a camera of this sophistication to catch that video cameras. Hmm. The dots are, in fact, you look at electrons, you, you looked at electrons for many years, which was nothing but television. So television is nothing but a screen, El electrons are coming in, and as electrons are coming in, the, the, the electrons are electromagnetically lensed in such a way that it is made to hit particular spots on the screen so that you see a hero dance or you see a TV program. So it, it, is, it will be visible. In fact, that finite region of resolution is what you call pixel. So it, it is possible, you can see that. So in, in, in 1924, Louis de Broglie, who was a French physicist, made the bold proposal that even, that even massive objects can obey as uh, both as a wave and a particle. Photon is fine, but even massive objects. By massive objects, not just electrons, not just electrons, but even you and me. So we are we made of particles or waves? De Broglie proposed that even particles with mass can obey as a wave. So now, now enters another person called Erwin Schrodinger. And Schrodinger in 1926, age 37, I write this because people think generally think that physics is young man's, a young man's game, but at 37 he pr he published one of the most important papers not just in quantum mechanics but also in all of 20th century physics so he l he laid out the foundations of something called wave mechanics so he 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 not just uh, mathematically put in place what this he he didn't know what this wave was but he put in place the mathematics behind this wave and also how that wave evolved with time so he gave a equation how this wave evolved with time and that equation is called the Schrodinger equation and again he was his theory was able to perfectly predict and match the experiments of the day which is very important at the same time even before Schrodinger there was a guy called Heisenberg and Heisenberg in, in, in fact Heisenberg was again he was a German and then he studied under Sommerfeld at the Munich Institute and he went to Göttingen this habilitation so he did his PhD in, the, uh, in uh, Maximilian University in Munich under Sommerfeld and then he did his habilitation which is uh, nowadays called postdoc at uh, under Max Born at Göttingen and then he went to Copenhagen to work with Niels Bohr in fact these three places are the golden uh, 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 vertices of the golden triangle of quantum mechanics only at these places you can say that quantum mechanics was born within these three spaces uh, places so he uh, during his stay at Göttingen, he he was actually uh, um, he got the hay fever and he went for vacationing, and during that vacation he came up with his own version of a theory, which explained the mystery of the atomic spectra readings, and then for the first time, his theory didn't care about the whys and the philosophical uh, um, aesthetics. All he cared about was what can I observe and what is my input that is it for example when we when we uh, broke our heads thinking of 
how come I get an in interference pattern in electron? He told that, no, I don't care what happens in between. All I care about is that, for example, the intensity of the accumulation of electrons. And he was very successful. In fact, Einstein, uh, we will we'll see that Einstein was a bit displeased and he, he uh, called Heisenberg and he told him, hey, that's fine, your theory is working. But have you thought about the underpinnings of uh, what is it? Uh, the, the philosophy behind this? And Heisenberg was a bit stunned because Einstein himself overthrew such uh, such philosophical uh, leanings or biases when he made his theory. So later Heisenberg writes that it was a bit surprising that Einstein told it that way. So and then uh, two years later in 1927, he gave his famous uncertainty principle. So what is this uncertainty principle? Uncertainty principle is that simply it says that you can never say a particle is here or a particle is there. And you can, you can say that, but if you say that a particle is here, you can never comment upon how fast this particle is going. So in other words, you need not even worry about that. You, you, it's, it is just that you, the certainty of saying that a particle is here, which was actually the thing uh, with the Newton's theory or any other theory up until that point, that everything was to be 100% predicted that a particle will be there, a planet will be there here at that point and so on. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle broke all that. So he told that the concept of uncertainty is absolutely lost in the quantum world. So in fact, the best that you can do is to say that a particle is probably here or a particle is probably there. So you can say, hey, you're talking science. Wow, how, how can you say that a particle is probably here or probably there? In fact, that is the best we can do. You can only say that a particle is 30% here, 70% here. That number you can accurately calculate. So quantum mechanics is not fuzzy about that. But at the end of the day, you can calculate only probabilities. So in fact, this has nothing to do with experimental apparatus. Even if you have an experimental apparatus with infinite precision, you cannot say that a particle is here or there. Yes? How did they do the last one? What the body was? This one? Yeah, the last one. Yes. How did they do that? So, the experimental apparatus can right. never get into something in the future to predict. Because, because experimentally, you find it so. Because there is something. So, as I said, this, since this is for Alamelo party, I have not uh, written any equations. But you can show that the best that you can do. In fact, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is a much more uh, accurate statement mathematically, which says that the, the product of the uncertainty in a particle's position multiplied by, the pro multiplied by the, its uncertainty in velocity can never be lesser than a constant. That is experimentally proven to be the case because you don't need infinite degree precision to achieve that state. Even with a very good degree of precision, you can achieve that lower limit, which has been achieved. In fact, nowadays it's even more accurate. In fact, there is something called as squeezed state where the particle is in such a, such a state that both its uh, uncertainty in position and uncertainty in momentum or velocity is minimal. But of course, you, experimentally, you, it is proven that you, it is not so. Uh, you can't do better than that. So this is what the, 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 then the question is that why is it that way? Well, the only answer that I or any professor or any Nobel laureate can give you is that nature is simply that way. Because this is something which is uh, utterly perplexing, even, even for uh, if you if you if you if you are wondering enna solran avan em ya or particle inga irukku niya solla mudiyadu abdinu neenga yosichinga na adhe da engalukku even even phd students even professors do, in fact they in fact there is a famous statement usually attributed to feynman but actually told by a physicist called david merman romba simple da the the quote is shut up and calculate that's it that is in fact that is you you never learn quantum mechanics the the best thing is that you get used to it doctor kitta sir valli ninruma illa valli valli polagidom appdi solra maari da so this is this is what you can do but einstein was not at all satisfied with quantum mechanics so he was very very displeased with uh, in, in fact uh, einstein 
yeah he was very displeased the philosophical underpinning and in, in the sense that how can a theory not tell you 100% uh, of the represent, uh, representation of the real world abdi illana enna theory adu abdina avarude philosophy he told that everything should be 100% predictable in fact at, at paul ehrenfest's house who was a very dear friend of uh, uh, einstein and also he was a student of boltzmann and he was one of the fatherly figures in quantum mechanics who in fact he himself did not produce any dazzling magical uh, original work he did produce a lot of original work it, it was not earth shaking but nonetheless his contribution to quantum mechanics is something very uh, valuable because he nurtured a lot of youngsters in fact almost 10 or 11 of his students won nobel prize and that is far more important than getting the nobel prize in itself in some cases so in his house einstein and bohr used to meet and they used to argue that hey what is this and then in fact i bohr was so fond of einstein that he often you uh, called for debates and even after einstein passed away bohr used to sit in his house and then imagine einstein is sitting in front of him and he just used to talk so and then that and then because of this quantum mechanics he he uttered his famous statement which is that god does not play dice it is not pro game of probability it, he, by, by god of course he didn't really mean uh, he was i don't think he, uh, in fact he did not believe in god but he believed in a pantheon or the greater workings of the universe which he denoted by god in fact i was that that was why i was careful this is even accurate in fact in his letter he writes not god but he so it's a misconception that he believes in god but he didn't but uh, uh, this is the this is a picture of bohr and einstein uh, uh, bohr is um, uh, surprisingly not having his pipe but this is at ehrenfest's house uh, where they are debating so and then the heisenberg and schrodinger they both gave a two pictures but they were both convinced that their own uh, theory is a little more accurate so schrodinger was unhappy with the matrix mechanics which heisenberg came in fact matrix matrices were not known to people back then in fact heisenberg when he when he put his rules he thought that he is doing something very uh, very uh, fancy and strange but mathematicians already knew it and it was called matrix when you multiply two matrix you have this weird rule where you multiply row and then column and then add and add them up separately and so on and so forth heisenberg uh, uh, invented it by himself but later found that it was matrix and then and then uh, schrodinger found matrix mechanics very ugly and heisenberg could not really fathom the existence of waves but he considered that uh, schrodinger's wave mechanics was very elegant but then the next person uh, paul dirac entered and showed that he 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 in fact showed that both heisenberg and schrodinger are talking about one and the same things he mathematically fully wrote down the formulation of quantum mechanics in fact he was so brilliant that uh, his contribution was so immense that he shared the nobel prize with schrodinger in 1933 and he thought that physical theories should not just represent reality but also must be very beautiful so he, he in fact freeman dyson one of the another famous celebrated physicists told that his discoveries were like exquisitely carved marble statues falling out of the sky one after the other in fact if you if you if you had the fortune or if you sometimes had the time to learn physics mathematically you would just simply be if you will fall in love with dirac's uh, approach to uh, solving problems very elegantly and very shortly in fact the notations which he introduced in 1926 is a, is a notation which we still use in textbooks for uh, learning quantum mechanics it's very elegant but of course he was a very peculiar person and dirac's childhood was a bit troubled uh, not troubled as in uh, his father was a very uh, very staunch man and he didn't uh, like talking english he was a swiss but he insisted that dirac talk only in french in fact there is a there is a research that said that dirac in, in his childhood he thought so his his mother and his sisters they will all uh, speak in english so in fact uh, dirac uh, so dirac's uh, dirac's father and he spoke in french and uh, uh, dirac's mother and dirac's sisters they spoke in english that dirac in his childhood thought that males and females speak different languages <laughs> and in fact uh, dirac dirac in when when they sat for dinner since uh, his father's insistence that dirac speak only french he uh, in fact he was not good at french and he sp he chose to not spoke at all in a lot of times and that in fact made him a very uh, silent person in fact in uh, there is a there is a funnily uh, people have coined a word called a dirac unit which means that uh, uh, one word an r or something like that 
so but however he was a very 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 uh, brilliant and utterly uh, under uh, undermined physicist we in physicist circles we know about the value of dirac but in general public people generally don't talk about dirac as much in fact einstein in the letter to paul ehrenfest told that i have a trouble with dirac and this balancing on the dizzying path between genius and madness is awful so but nonetheless dirac was survived but Dirac survived, but unfortunately, Paul Ehrenfest did not. So, for some reason, Ehrenfest fell into depression, and uh, in I think in 1933, in fact, Einstein wrote uh, to the institute where Ehrenfest was there to reduce his workload, so that he he uh, his depression is a bit uh, taken care of. But unfortunately, Paul Ehrenfest uh, he he made his will, he made everything okay for his for his sons in one of his one of his sons had a down syndrome and what he did was he took a pistol he went upstairs shot his boy and then shot himself and then it was a very tragic end uh, but nonetheless his contributions to quantum mechanics is something we will we would remember uh, forever so we introduced these quantum numbers and uh, um, so this so we, we saw that Bohr introduced a quantum number n and then Sommerfeld introduced a quantum number k. The Schrodinger and Heisenberg introduced another quantum number called m. But then even then something was missing. And then that something was missing which, would, which, which, which we could not uh, explain the elements in the periodic table. If What is periodic table? Periodic table is nothing but listing of atoms. So they must have a pattern. There must be a logic for why elements behave the way they do. They were not able to completely explain that, but for that you needed another quantum number and that quantum number is called the spin quantum number. So the spin was Goudsmit and Ohlenbeck uh, who were Ehrenfest students. Ehrenfest had a knack of finding who would work well with who and he always paired them up. And uh, they both of them they proposed that electrons have this uh, thing called spin. Right? And then, uh, in fact, <laughs> Goudsmit and Ohlenberg, when they sent, uh, before that, uh, Aaron first had sent the paper to uh, another person, a very eminent senior physicist called Lawrence. And Lawrence replied back saying that this is nonsense because electron cannot spin. Because if you if electron spins, then that's uh, he, classically he calculated that uh, that spins revolution speed must be higher than the speed of light. But relativity told that nothing can move faster than the speed of light. But then Goudsmit and Hollenberg sent the paper already, and then Heron first apparently told Goudsmit and Hollenberg it is good that you don't have any reputation. It is okay if it is wrong. You can always build from the scratch. But fortunately, it happened to be true because Lawrence used classical physics. To calculate his cal to do his calculations, but classical physics was wrong for electrons, and it survived. So, a uh, spin, spin. Okay, what is spin? Well, every particle in this universe has this property called spin. This naming of this is a bit unfortunate because nothing really spins, because electrons, as far as we know, does not have a structure. If I tell you electron has a structure, then I must tell you what electron is made of. If I tell you that electron is made of electrons, that is a ridiculous answer. So as far as we know, electron is a point particle. So if electron spins, then if I keep a dot on the electron and see if the dot moves or not, then the question is, okay, what is the dot lying on? And so on and so forth. But these are all not, these are misconceptions. Elect the electrons does not really spin like a top or anything. Just like how uh, electrons have mass, uh, just like how electrons have mass, just like how electron has charge, it has spin. Just like how you have weight, you have name, it has spin. It is a property. That's it. So some particles have half integer spins. Some particles have integer spins. There is nothing in between. There is nothing quarter integer or anything like that. Just half integer and uh, integer. And then the, 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 the particles that have integer spins, one of the famous particles is uh, the photons. And another one is uh, electron. Electron is a half integer spin. In fact, the spin was first properly theorized by Kronig. And Kronig went to this personality called Wolfgang Pauli. And Pauli told that, hey, this is wrong. And Kronig did not publish it. In fact, Kronig later felt bad that he, he must have gone with his own convictions that 
he felt bad that he did not publish it. In fact, the Nobel Prize Committee, since they, in fact, they wanted to give Uhlenbeck and uh, and Goudsmit the Nobel Prize for suggesting spin, but since Kronig had already published, uh, 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 came up with the idea but never published, they could not give to Uhlenbeck. They could not give to Kronig because he had not published. So, in fact, Pauli later felt very bad and guilty about suggesting uh, Kronig that his uh, spin theory was wrong, but in fact, it was right. So, who was this Wolfgang Pauli? So Pauli is actually one of the most brilliant physicists known for his acerbic wit and uh, very strong opinions. In fact, he used to say that every time I say something, contradict me by saying something very strongly against what I said. In fact, there is a famous uh, epigraphy that uh, Pauli, uh, there is this number called a uh, fine structure constant. You don't need to know what that is. It is a dimensionless number and it is 1 over 137. People were wondering why it is 1 over 137. And then uh, people were, uh, 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 you know, scratching their heads and so on and so forth. But even uh, uh, back then, they didn't know. So Pauli, uh, yeah, Pauli died. He went to heaven, and then he sees God, and then he asks God, "Hey God, why is fine structure constant one over one thirty-seven?" So God smiles and asks him to sit down, takes a chalk and goes to a blackboard, and starts lecturing. And after two hours. He completes the lecture, sees uh, uh, Pauli and smiles and says, that is why. And Pauli says, bollocks, you are wrong. You are a fool. That's what Pauli would say, even to God. In fact, uh, his, his, his acerbic wit is very well known that when he first met Paul Ehrenfest, uh, Ehrenfest told Pauli that I hear, tongue in the cheek, that I hear that you are a better physicist than a person. And then Pauli replied back, it's funny that I was thinking the exact opposite of you. <laughs> so, uh, he's a very colorful person. And of course, it's not that he was arrogant, but he was very strong in his convictions. He always considered gracefully when he was wrong. So, that must also be said. In fact, he scantily published any papers, but wrote a lot of letters. In fact, the very famous journals that you see now, you would have letters of physical review and so on. That's because back then, it was just letters. Uh, people were not, the, the peer publishing, uh, this uh, publish or perish culture, was uh, was is something that's fairly new. Even peer reviewing was fairly new. In fact, there is a story uh, where Einstein uh, tried to rederive his equations, his general relativity equations, in a different coordinates, and then he thought uh, he 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 came to the conclusion that gravitational waves cannot exist, and he published it, published it to the Physical Review uh, Journal. The Physical Review uh, referee, uh, the editor, when he saw it, he saw there was something wrong with this, and he he sent it to peer reviewing, to another learned men. And they, they pointed out a mistake and he wrote back to Einstein and Einstein was furious. Einstein told that who asked you to send my work to other physicists to assess them? Your job is to publish them. And after that, he never sent any paper to physical review. It was very surprising that, uh, but of course, I don't think it's something that has to do with Einstein, but perhaps the publishing culture even uh, back then was not so much of peer reviewing uh, oriented. But nonetheless, he proposed something called as the exclusion principle. And the exclusion principle says simply that no two electrons can occupy the same space. In fact, the reason that you are sitting down, that you are sitting on a chair, why aren't you going through the chair? That is because the electrons and one is the electromagnetic forces, but then both are neutral objects. You, you, your legs are neutral, the floor is neutral. Why isn't it going through? It is actually because of Pauli's exclusion principle, because no two solids can ever occupy the same space, same point in space. If that is the case, the objects would just go through. In fact, that is one of the, one of the startling daily uh, 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 daily day uh, consequence of quantum mechanics, which people you know hardly know. So, so this is known as exclusion principle because they are excluded from each other. They can never occupy the same space, same point in space. So, is the same space or same quantum space? Space, physical 3D space. In fact, now the question of state, quantum state, if two particles had the same quantum state, they can occupy the same physical point in 3D space. In fact, of course, I must have been much more accurate, but since Alamelu party does not want to know what a quantum state is, this is nonetheless uh, not inaccurate at all. In fact, uh, the solids being solids is only because of Pauli's exclusion principle. Physically, you can't, you can't penetrate and go. So, uh, so then this exclusion principle said that
So the, when electrons fill up the atoms around the nucleus, they fill up in such a way. But when you are talking about the bird file stuff, yes, it was going through. No. No. In fact, new atoms are so much of an empty space that, in fact, if you imagine Chepok Stadium to be an atom, a, a TT ball kept at the center of the pitch would be the nucleus. Such is uh, so the atom is such a widely, uh, very loosely dense uh, object. So that there is no problem with that. In fact, the reason why it cannot go through it, it is not that it went through the nucleus. As it went near the nucleus, it got deflected. So that's how they were able to find that there was nucleus at the center. So this, uh, when when Pauli gave his exclusion principle, now everything was fine. Uh, the, it, the, the, the periodic table made perfect sense and then uh, uh, there, but again there are particles which do not obey exclusion principle and one such example is of course the photons. In fact we the particles that obey Pauli's exclusion principle is called fermions and the particles that don't are called bosons. The bosons does the name ring familiar? Yes, yes. so Bose. no Bose. Bose. Satyendranath Bose. So he was born in Calcutta in 1894 and he was actually polyglot. He knew many languages. Uh, he knew Bengali, English, French, German, etc. And he was also into music and apparently he played the Esraj very fluently. And uh, he was a very studious student. He, was, he stood first in his school and he also stood first in his uh, presidency college, uh, Calcutta. In fact, this is his uh, mark list <laughs> that you can see. So he, he did something called as a mixed mathematics. The, uh, back then they didn't have physics as such. But you, you can see that the, the subject name is not listed, but you can see that 98, 85, 100, 89, 88, this must, this must have been very good marks for them. You can see that the total out of 800 is 736. But these days, I don't know if you would have crossed the cutoff, but good that he was born back then. So Bose was a reader at the Dhaka, Dhaka University. And then, in fact, uh, since I told you that the physics was primarily happening in, only in Germany, the journals were also, was also done in German, uh, was published only in German. So what he did, he went, just because he wanted to be uh, updated in physics, he went and learned German. And then he also translated Einstein's work, Einstein's relativity uh, to English. In fact, the publisher in Germany knew that there was this guy who was publishing books here in India. He came and he put a case on Bose and then Bose wrote to Einstein and then Einstein intervened and told that no 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 it's okay as long as the books circulate only in the subcontinental region I'm fine with it because he liked the work so and then in 1924 he was actually giving a lecture in the Dhaka University and while giving a lecture do you remember the first Planck uh, Planck's way out where Planck proposed a law he tried to rederive the same law but in a different route while giving a lecture in fact, he, he uh, got an epiphany and then he completed the derivation and then he immediately wrote uh, in English to the German journals. But then his work was not uh, published, even though the work was very revolutionary. The reason may have been that it is a language. So what he did, he, he sent directly to Einstein just to translate the work. So he, he emailed his English version directly to no lesser person than Einstein himself because he would translate because he could not write in German. He could, of course, knowing a little German and knowing English well, he could translate German to English. But the other way around was not possible because he was not as fluent in German as he was in English. So this is a letter that he wrote. Uh, so uh, th these are slightly technical. I have ventured to send this to you. And if you see here, uh, if you if you think the paper is worthy of the publication ah, ah, here I do not know sufficient German to translate this paper if you think the paper worthy of publication I shall be grateful if you uh, send it for publication, for its publication in yeah in, uh, in in physic it's, it's in German so though a complete stranger to you I do not feel any hesitation in making such a request because we are all your pupil Though, though profiting only through your uh, teachings and writings. I do not know whether you remember this, but somebody from Calcutta asked your permission to translate your papers on relativity in English. You acceded to the request and then the book has since been published. It was me who translated your paper on generalized relativity. So this was a letter he wrote to Einstein. And then Einstein immediately realized the consequence of the paper and he sent it 
to the journal that he asked. The journal that he asked was no lesser journal. It was a top journal in which the works of a leading physicist like Einstein himself was being published. And then he in fact wrote a side note saying that this is a very important paper. And then this, this revolutionized because this treated particles as indistinguishable. It said that, hey, if I take this photon and that photon, and if I interchange this, nothing, no physics will change in this universe. It is as though both the particles are the same. But for electrons, it is not possible because this, the address of this electron and the address of this electron is completely different. So that's what Pauli's exclusion principle said. So his, his, his paper created, in fact, a new field called quantum statistics and then uh, so yeah so in other words uh, unlike electrons two or more photons can have the same electron so you have both these particles called bosons and fermions so the particles that have half independence of fermions they obey fermi dirac statistics in fact the one who gave the term boson was dirac dirac realized the importance of uh, bose's paper and when in fact bose's work was actually worthy of a nobel prize but uh, then for some reason he did not i don't think it was uh, uh, racism or anything of that sort in fact arnold sommerfeld who was nominated 81 times for the nobel prize he did not get even once and we saw that gilbert lewis who was nom nominated 41 times he did not get one so bose was nominated in 1958 and 59 but somehow he did not get the nobel prize but but far more than the Nobel Prize, his name is etched in the history through this term of bosons, which physicists will call for a long time to come. And then, okay, all that said, the last slide, <coughs> quantum mechanics in real life. Okay, in fact, there is a vast story from 1927 to 2017 of which I cannot talk about. But quantum mechanics, the work that was done back then was a seed to many, many things that we use today in daily life. For example, one, is all the computers and smartphones. If not for the transistors, if not for the quantum mechanics, we would not know how to assemble or to, to fabricate transistors the way we do right now, efficiently. And the another one is, of course, lasers and telecommunications. And laser is another important such technology which came in the 50s. And uh, you need quantum uh, transition amplitudes to understand laser. If not for quantum mechanics, there would be no laser. And then atomic clocks and GPS. Atomic clocks, again, you use the CCM atom to calibrate uh, the, yeah, to calibrate uh, precisely what the time is. And if not for this, you, you need about 10 decimal places precision if you want to correctly come into Parkview Road. Else you would be very off. And the another is, of course, the MRI scans, which use the spins of electrons with respect to the nucleus. And the next upcoming hot research field right now is a quantum computing, which uses the spins of electrons. So right now we know that the binaries are made of ones and zeros, voltage or no voltage. But now you can also have a binary system of spin half plus half and spin minus half. So it is it's still a very active research and uh, I, I, I hear that uh, most recently a computer was able to do a factorization much faster than a classical computer but it, I'm sure that uh, quantum computing will be uh, the future when it comes to uh, computer science. And then you. In fact we miss the fact that we are made of atoms and electrons and protons and quarks and so on and so forth but if not for quantum mechanics i won't be talking and you won't be listening and this all these things the universe being the way it is will not happen and of course that's also a real life and of course everything the whole universe obeys quantum mechanics and if if we want to know the truth there is no other way of going around quantum mechanics if you want to find a more fundamental law you can't find a law which which does not obey quantum mechanics. It must obey quantum mechanics at some point or so. So with that said, uh, I thank you very much to have patiently listened. And uh, thanks to Gopu for giving me the stage. So are there any questions that you would like to ask? There is no such thing called a stupid question. You can ask whatever you want. Yes. So you say electron does not have a spin, but still you are talking about spin. Yes. Yes. So the thing is, it is a quantum mechanical concept. So classically, what we are used about is big objects doing this, doing that, and so on. Exactly, exactly. But that is not the case. Spin is something quantum, quantum mechanical. You can't even imagine spin. I would say that don't try to imagine spin. It's just an unfortunate name. That's all. Right. Yes? Darkness is just uh, absence of light. That's what I would call it. What? So, Elliot Luthor 
ஒன்னோ <laughs> absence of light is not darkness absence of, of light is darkness so so light adding opposite to each other is as good as saying there is no light at all right yes so when you talk about particles hmm. actually when electrons protons neutrons all those things right, right. Uh, but when we talk about the uncertainty physical right you said we cannot pinpoint accurately the location exactly but we also talked about photons uh, being restricted to a very tiny space right so we should be able to fairly accurately predict the location when you say fairly accurately you can fairly accurately predict okay. i can't say it is there so that width of that that fringe of 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 uncertainty is what is dictated by the uncertainty principle okay. how do we explain the at the structure of graphite ah at at scales higher than the atom at the, in fact the scales of you and me that fuzziness is so minute that classical mechanics works very well so in fact quantum mechanics if you have a supercomputer and calculate schrodinger equation again and again and again very fast you would get the classical world it averages out really well but at the level of quantum uh, scales it is very strange that you can't say that a particle is here or a particle is there in fact in fact the very you, you touched upon the the problem of our intuition which we with which we try to understand the world the our window of intuition of perception of universe is very very narrow universe functions in a very vast scale both on the higher the radius of the radius of the universe and to the radius of quarks but somehow our intuitions in daily life does not really correspond to the true nature of things that are happening Uh, uh, just a minute yeah so uh, continuing to his question huh. so you said uh, when two lights from the opposite uh, uh, meet they kind of cancel out right so it, if it's a wave it's understandable if it's a particle where do those particles go do they just disappear ah so again it is our intuition due to which we put a thing into a basket of particle or into a basket of wave in this scenario wave thinking uh, the uh, photons to be uh, thinking light to be a wave explains it in some other situations thinking it as a particle explains it is it a wave or a particle this question has a problem in the question itself not in the answer in fact i can give you a far more accurate picture if i write just one equation so that is a problem that physics the language of physics is not english but mathematics which is happens to be the case in fact the mathematics that that we that is that was used in quantum mechanics was done my way earlier in fact the quantum field theory right now which we have at the cutting edge the math was that for the, the math was uh, for that was done in 1800s they they didn't know that it was going to represent the physical world in some in fact அவ்வையர் சொன்ன மாதிரி நெல்லுக்கு இறைத்த நீர் வாய்க்கால் வழியோடி புல்லுக்கும் மாங்கே புசியுமாங்கிற மாதிரி அவங்க பண்ணி வச்சது நெல்லுக்கு ஆனால் இப்போ ஃபிசிக்ஸுக்கு வந்து யூ யூஸ் தட் டு எக்ஸாக்ட்லி ரெப்ரஸண்ட் த ஃபிசிக்கல் வேர்ல்ட் இன்ஃபேக்ட் யூஜின் விக்னர் இன் ஒன் ஆஃப் இஸ் ஃபேமஸ் ஆர்டிகல்ஸ் ரோட் த அன்ரீசனபிள் எஃபெக்டிவ்னஸ் ஆஃப் மேத்தமேட்டிக்ஸ் இஃப் யூ ஹேவ் டைம் ப்ளீஸ் டூ பாண்டர் ஓவர் தட் ஆர்டிகல் தட் வை ஷுட் யூனோ திஸ் சம் ஃபேர்லி எசோட்டரிக் நம்பர் லைக் பை play a role in calculation of your interest bank interest you know but somehow that's that's how the world is and uh, that mathematics is a much more precise language with which i can describe but uh, that's the trouble with the uh, english so it has the shortcoming of english not the shortcoming of uh, quantum physics yes yes how do you relate to entropy which is we all hear as uh, uncertainty to answer the principle so uh, so the entropy and uncertainty principle are something something different so the entropy that we talk about is that so so if i take a so if this if this room was full of vacuum and if i had a bottle of gas bottled up and i opened the bottle 
the gas will come out of the bottle and it will start spreading all over the room but the reverse will not happen in fact the reverse can happen but the probability of that happening is very 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 less that is entropy uncertainty principle is something that's completely quantum mechanical so that thermodynamic entropy has no relation to uncertainty principle as such right yes sure yeah right is that some kind of a lifetime of photons ah photons do not decay so it forever? exactly it would exist forever right in fact that is the reason why we can see sun if not sun would the, the because uh, in fact that's why uh, when i showed you that red and white uh, picture red changes and produces blue blue changes produces red is a self sustaining thing it will keep on going where does that get there it's like a Machine. Exactly. It doesn't exist in no, 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 no. It is. In fact, a wave. It's. It, it is a radiation dictated by the laws of electromagnetism. It, that is. That is the way it is. Energy is conserved. Where does that packet of energy hmm. get energy to form water? So, so, so. Hmm? Whatever the source is, it, you already pack the energy. Exactly. Right. Right. It is a traveling energy box. Right. Which can pass on the energy when something stops it. Exactly. Right. It's right, right. It's of state. Exactly. It's right, right. It has energy. That energy it will have when the when a photon or when an electromagnetic light has left sun, with the same energy it will come here. So I understand your question. It's like something is getting created. Uh, how come something is getting created? Right. That is that has nothing to do with energy conservation, but it has to do with the loss of electromagnetism. But energy is conserved. It's not a self perpetuating machine. Self perpetuating machine should produce a new energy. But we don't have such machines in science. Uh, that's that's prohibited. Energy is always conserved. There, I saw one other hand raise. Yes. Ah, Chandra Shekhar. He uh, he was a guy who applied quantum mechanics. In fact, he also applied quantum mechanics to stellar objects. So, in fact, I told you that uh, you had you asked if uh, electrons are physically are they physically or quantum mechanically. In fact, Chandra Shekhar. Uh, so when you, when you when you have a ball of gas due to gravitation they must attract each other and form a ball right and they must come together chandrasekhar asked the question okay what is the limit because pauli's exclusion principle says that no two electrons can occupy the same point in space so what is the star that you can find which can turn into a black hole or cannot turn into a black hole using quantum mechanics and he found something called as a chandrasekhar limit which is i think about 1.2 times the solar mass or something like that 1.4 right 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 1.45 right right so so he his his field was in astrophysics uh, but of course uh, so uh, this this putting into baskets is something which we do this is astrophysics this is laser physics nature doesn't give a damn of what we do it's it's all the same for them for nature but uh, but yes he did use quantum mechanics to do his work pioneering work in astrophysics right i saw one of the right yes yeah, sure and sure and for, uh, space and then our Sure, sure. Uh, so, if we throw an object, uh, and uh, on, the, on the path of the attack, attack the attack. So, on the time, at a particular point, uh, we can reach uh, the speed of it. Ah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. 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 நம்ம இப்படி நினைக்கிறோம் இல்ல இட்ஸ் நேச்சுரல் டு திங்க் ஆக்சிலரேட் ஆகி போயிட்டே இருந்தது என்ன இப்ப நான் ஒரு ஆயிரம் மைல் இருந்து டென்னிஸ் பாலை டிராப் பண்ணா ஸ்பீடு ஏற 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 ஒரு பாயிண்ட் ஸ்பீட் ஆஃப் லைட்டோட அதிகம் போய் தான் ஆகணும் அப்படின்னு தோணும்ல நமக்கு பட் தட் இஸ் நாட் த கேஸ் விச் இஸ் அட்டர்லி கவுண்டர் இன்ட்யூட்டர் அது நமக்கு அது வந்து புரிஞ்சுக்க முடியாது பட் தட் இஸ் த உண்மை எக்ஸ்பெரிமெண்டலி வி சி தட் நோ மேட்டர் வாட் யூ நோ பார்ட்டிகல் வித் மாஸ் கேன் எக்ஸீட் த ஸ்பீட் ஆஃப் லைட் ஆமாம் எப்படி ஆகுது அப்பரண்ட் 
நமக்கு <laughs> 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 that is why yes uh, who is this uh, jc bose contradicted uh, ah so jc bose was this, actually a teacher of bose jagdish chandra bose was uh, a teacher of this was satyendranath bose satyendranath bose meghnath saga ivangala ore set meghnath saga joined about 2 years after uh, bose uh, did in fact when meghnath saga contradicted that time not uh, aware of an incident but his uh, his scientific uh, his scientific work didn't really contradict in fact avaroda work boss number number boss oda work vandu was something utterly new so it didn't really contradict appo so in the in fact uh, meghnad saha when meghnad saha retired from allahabad university ervin schrodinger applied for allahabad university for that position and he was accepted but second world war intervened and he could not join allahabad university already vandir paringa so in fact one read about the famous uh, bose experiment that was uh, the, with plants no the, the what is that the parallel and stuff they built up god particle experiment right so so the thing bose did experiments with uh, waves with uh, electromagnet in fact in fact uh, this bose also did uh, experiments with electromagnetic waves so um, the, in, in fact this bose was Uh, uh, just a small trivia he was also a playful person that when india conducted its he was a nationalist and he in fact insisted that all indian universities make their own experiments don't buy from other you try to make it from the scratch and so on when uh, when india conducted its first general election um, apparently the the, the government uh, the election commission told that my weapon the my alikave mudiyadu abdin they told but then bos was like uh, he was playful and he found a solution which can erase that uh, my as a hobby but then uh, that cell tells about you know he's not just uh, an everyday uh, studious student who likes to just sit and uh, uh, study his textbook he was also an you know an explorer and also a playful being but this experiment that you are talking about i'm not really aware of uh, what experiment it is and uh, about what it was so perhaps i can get back to you later after reading on Recently they have a large oh, 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 I'm very sorry. I thought you had asked about the experiment done by Bose. I understand. So in 2012, they, there is something called as Higgs boson. Uh, Higgs boson uh, Peter Higgs and five other people uh, uh, told about it. Uh, that it should exist but we didn't find an uh, evidence in fact fermi lab where i am uh, right now doing my phd uh, in fermi lab they tried to search they had a slight signal but it was not good enough and then uh, at cern which is a much higher energy uh, so what they do is they take one proton another proton accelerate to very high energies and then smash and then when they smash because of the high energy many particle debris just just explodes out and then you keep detectors all around and you catch you see the particles that come out and see whether you can find any new law or not in this finding the higgs boson was very very difficult in fact statistically the finding the higgs boson was like finding a uh, 12 needle sticks in a olympic swimming pool full of hay அந்த வைக்கோல்ல ஒரு பன்னெண்டு குண்டு சீ தேடுற அளவுக்கு ஸ்டாட்டிஸ்டிக்ஸ் இருந்தது பட் தே வேர் ஏபிள் டு ஃபைண்ட் இட் அட் லாஸ்ட் ஹிக்ஸ் போசான் ஆக்சுவலி சந்த் ஹேஸ் சம்திங் டு டூ வித் கிவிங் மாஸ் டு பார்ட்டிகல்ஸ் த கொஸ்டின் ஆஃப் வை டஸ் அ பார்ட்டிகல் ஹேவ் மாஸ் ஸோ ஹிக்ஸ் 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 சஜஸ்டட் தட் தெர் இஸ் அ ஃபீல்ட் விச் வி நோ கால்ட் ஹிக்ஸ் ஃபீல்ட் அண்ட் தென் இட் இன்ட்ராக்ஸ் வித் தட் ஃபீல்ட் அண்ட் இட் கெட்ஸ் த மாஸ் ஸோ இட் வாஸ் அ பிக் ட்ரைம் இன்ஃபேக்ட் இஸ் அ பிக் அச்சீவ்மெண்ட் இன்ஜினியரிங் ஃபீல்ட் அண்ட் த சயின்டிஃபிக் என்டர்பிரைஸ் ஹஸ் சேஞ்ச் சோ மச் தட் நோ லாங்கர் அ பர்சன் கேன் ஜஸ்ட் டூ எக்ஸ்பெரிமெண்ட் அட் த பேக் ஆஃப் இஸ் ஹவுஸ் and uh, get away with it so it's a marvelous achievement so thank you once again akash for a very wonderful lecture i think it was a so besides just the physics half of which i understood half of which i realized i had misunderstood and you know bunch of new things that i realized that i haven't even known about so fantastic personally i'm sure some of you had uh, some variation in the spectrum of uh, experiences So wonderful I mean, to you know talk about all the personalities all the characters you know all the inc- incidents that brought people together and you know a couple of tragedies here and there so wonderful narration thank you very very much 
He does some things on, you know, like occasionally shows stuff on YouTube and all that. So perhaps he'll continue to do, you know, uh, shared YouTube videos and all that. So thank you once again, Akash, and uh, uh, thank you all for coming, and hope to see you next month. Thank you.